Hey guys, welcome back everyone. This is my last podcast for a while because of life and uni related issues, but I feel like I told you guys about the importance of literature. But the best thing about literature in my opinion and what truly inspires me are the lessons you can learn that can be implemented into your day-to-day life. It really helped me grow as a person, so I'll be sharing a few of my favorite books and a detailed view on a theme or two that actually truly resonated with me. If you guys are from my AP literature class, this might be one one book you're familiar with. The House of Spirits by The House of Spirits by Isabel Allende. The theme I'll be focusing on in depth is the power of women. The protagonist Protagonists of the novel are all women who work in different and subtle ways to assert their right. The House of Spirits can be seen as a woman-centered response to the text of magical realism. Gabriel Garcia, Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, where 100 Years of Solitude centers around three generations of men, with women whom they love as important but secondary characters. The House of Spirits does the opposite. Clara, Blanca, and Alba remain the focus of the story, while Esteban, Pedro, and Miguel enter the story because they are the men those women love or marry. Experiences particularly central to the lives of women dominate the minor as well as the major events in the story, such as the detailed descriptions of each childbirth and the, uh, and the abortion, as well as the presentation of physical and sexual violence against women. Aside from Nevaeh's comment to female suffrage, the women re- rarely explicitly condemn gender inequality. Each woman's life is, however, marked by it. All of the women in the House of Spirits are strong women who do not bow to mistreatment. They choose subtle responses to the situation, though instead of outright revolt. This very method um, of violence can be seen as particularly feminine. If violence and activity are male traits, while gent- gentleness and passivity, and passivity are female ones, the House of Spirits shows this does not mean that th- this does not mean that men accomplish things and change things while mo- women do not. On the contrary, the women in the House of Spirits affect more long-lasting and drastic changes than do any of the men. While the men lead revolutions that topple governments of, um, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, well, that topple governments, and the, and, the, and the revolutions themselves are quickly toppled, the women's subtler methods of teaching literacy and basic healthcare, setting cur- uh, curses, and refusing to speak are far more effective in exacting permanent change than any of the men's um, trials in the past. The next book I'll be discussing is To Kill a Mockingbird, and the theme I will be discussing is about good and evil, evil humanity and dignity. To Kill a Mockingbird follows Scout, a six-year-old over the course of three years as she begins to grow, and in the process bears witness to the trial of Tom Robinson, a black man wrongly accused of raping a white woman. As a child, Scout has set ideas regarding what's good and what's evil, but throughout the novel, Her father, Atticus, gradually begins to encourage her to see the world isn't divided into good people and bad people. Rather, he suggests that all people are composed of of a mix of good and bad qualities, but regardless, everyone is deserving of being treated with dignity and respect. At first, Scout and her brother Jem hold very black and white views of what's good and what's evil. They believe that most of the people in Maycomb are good, as is the law, but in their eyes, the Radley family from down the street and specifically the youngest adult son Arthur Radley is evil as is their elderly neighborhood uh, as is their elderly elder elderly neighbor my apologies in the other direction Mrs. DuBose however this ignores or contradicts over some of Scout's more nuanced observations such as the fact that Miss Stephanie a good Maycomb lady by many standards is a horrible gossip and nobody should believe what she says Yet Scout lumps Miss Stephanie in with, mu- in, in with Maycomb at large as a good part of her life. Meanwhile, there is little evidence that Arthur Radley, whom the children call Boo, is a bad person. In fact, there is little evidence that he exists at all. Scout and Jim believe that Boo is evil because of, his, of, because of childish neighborhood rumors that Boo survives on cats and squirrels and spends his evenings, evenings peeping into people's windows. In other words... Scout's world is clearly more complex than strict terms of good and evil, even if she doesn't have the maturity to fully recognize this. Through Tom Robinson's trial, Scout has a number of opportunities to begin to, to, begin to question her initial assumptions about whether people are good or bad, and Atticus's behavior impresses upon her that one of the best things a person can do is help another person maintain their dignity, which he does by defending Robinson. It's confusing for Scout when she hears peers, extended family, and even adults in town, many of whom 
previously fallen into her quote-unquote good category, take issue with Atticus's defense of Robinson, defense that she understands that Robinson is entitled to under the law. Because of this, Gout has to grapple with the fact that people despise Atticus for doing his job, which begins to suggest that the people of Maycomb aren't as overwhelmingly good as Gout initially thought. Indeed, many of them are extremely racist, and while they may treat their white neighbors kindly with compassion, it's unthinkable for many of them to extend that kind of generosity to their black neighbors or employees. I scout one second. Oh, I'm going off and I need a little sip of water. <laughs> All right, let's continue. So as Scout comes to understand that her town and neighborhood aren't as good as she initially thought, she also has several opportunities to discover that seemingly evil villains in her life are actually not as villainous as she once believed. Though Mrs. DuBose is a foul woman who hurls insults, slurs, and other abuse at every member of the Finch family, including Jim and Scout, she also grows beautiful chamomiles, of which she is very proud of a small quirk that humanizes her to the reader, if not to the children. Further, Atticus shares after her death that Mrs. DuBose was a morphine addict who, in attempt to die free with dignity, broke herself of her addiction in, in the weeks before her death. While this doesn't substantially change how Gem and Scout view Mrs. DuBose, as they remain fixated on the awful way she treated them in Atticus, Atticus makes the point that every person, no matter how unsavory they may seem, has their own sense of dignity that his children, and for that matter, the reader, should make every effort to recognize and respect. Similarly, Arthur Radley makes a dramatic leap in Scout's mind from a nefarious presence to the reason she's, al to the reason she's alive, when a few months after Robinson tri uh, Robinson's trial, he kills Mr. Owl, the man who accused um, Robinson of raping his daughter, Mayella, in defense of Scout and Jim whom Mr. Ewell tries to murder on their way home from a Halloween pageant. While the particulars of, the event, um, particulars of events that, not, that that night raise a number of questions about morality, as Arthur does murder Mr. Ewell, both the adults and Scout choose to focus on the fact that what Arthur did was something that saved the lives of Jim and Scout. It's possible that he also saved the lives of Mr. Ewell's abused children and, pervert, and, preserved the, and preserved some sense of safety in the town by removing its most dangerous resident. This situates Arthur as one of the novelist's mockingbirds. In, the, in, 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 that he, in, he, in that he helps and even puts himself in danger for others despite the wider world, world's cruelty toward him. Possibly more importantly than the novel's exploration of the nuances of adult characters, however, is its portrayal, portrayal of Scout herself as a morally complex individual. While not maliciously racist, Scout still parrots racist slurs and beliefs that she hears others espouse. Even in the midst of Robinson's trial, at one point she tries to comfort Doe, who is upset by the prosecution's racist treatment of Robinson, with the assertion that, the, that Rob with the assertion that Robinson is just another black man, and therefore it's not worth getting too upset over his treatment, as it's just the way things are. However, she does begin to question this and other thoughts and behaviors of her past. Most notably, when she begins to feel guilty for the way that she, Jim, and Dill surely tormented Arthur Radley for years. In this way, the novel proposes that everyone, no matter how seemingly good or seemingly bad, is nuanced and contains both good and evil. And most importantly, importantly that through exposure, time, and maturity, it's, it's possible to become increasingly better. The next book I'd like to discuss is considered a children's book. However, I feel like a lot of adults can learn from it. I've, I'll be discussing two of its themes, however, I won't have this podcast drag on, so it'll be pretty brief, but you should all consider reading this book. The book is titled The Little Prince, and it's truly amazing. So, the first theme I'll be discussing is the dangers of narrow-mindedness. For the most part, The Little Prince characterizes narrow-mindedness as a trait of adults. In the very first chapter, the narrator draws a sharp contrast between the, pers the respective ways grown-ups and children view the world. He depicts grown-ups as unimaginative, dull, superficial, and stubbornly sure that their limited perspective is the only one possible. He depicts children, on the other hand, as imaginative, open-minded, and, uh, and aware of and, sen and sensitive to the myster mystery and beauty of the world. In the story's opening pages, the narrator explains that grown-ups lack the imagination to see drawing number one, which represents a boa constrictor swallowing an elephant as anything other than a hat. As the story progresses, other examples of the blindness of adults emerge. 
As the little prince travels from planet to planet, the six adults he encounters proudly reveal their character traits, whose contradictions and shortcomings the little prince then exposes. The little prince represents the open-mindedness of children. He is a wanderer who, re who restlessly asks questions and is willing to engage the invisible, to engage the invisible secret mysteries of the universe. The novel suggests that such inquisit, 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 such inquisitiveness is the key to understanding and to happiness. However, the little prince shows that age is not the main factor separating grown-ups from children. The narrator, for example, has aged enough to forget how to draw, but he is still enough of a child to understand and befriend the young foreign little prince. The next theme I'll be discussing is relationships teach responsibility. The little prince teaches that responsibility demanded by relationships with others leads to greater understanding and appreciation of one's responsibilities to the world in general. The story of the prince and his rose is parable, a story that teaches a lesson about the nature of real love. The prince's love for his rose is the driving force behind the novel. The prince leaves his planet because of the rose. The rose permeates the prince's discussions with the narrator, and eventually, the rose becomes the reason the prince wants to return to his planet. The source of the prince's love is his sense of responsibility towards his beloved rose. rose. When the fox asks to be tamed, he explains to the little prince that investing oneself in another person makes that person and, every asso and everything associated with him or her more special. The little prince shows that what one gives to another is even more important that than what one th when the, than what, what than what the other gives back in return. So yeah, that's it for the little, little prince, and that's it for this podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope you guys are now interested in re reading all the books I've discussed. This again is the last podcast for a while, sadly. However, I might return to making a podcast about literature in the future. Um, thank you for those of you who stuck with me for the past three podcasts. I much appreciated. If you have any advice, just leave it down in the comment the comment section below. And yeah, um, I guess for the last time for a while, go make like a tree and leaf. Go read. <laughs>